Okay, so we are going to continue with uh, with this problem here. We're actually just going to start over. So take a moment to read it. And now, let's get started. Okay. So the gutter that uh, the gutter is going to be able to carry water or contain water. And essentially, since we're trying to figure out the maximum amount of water, we are trying to, let's see here, so our goal is to maximize the area of this trapezoid. And so here's the trapezoid that we're talking about. So it's the trapezoid that is formed with, let me make this smaller. So this angle is theta, right? This angle is theta. The length of the base of the trapezoid is 10 centimeters. Okay. And we know that the sides are also 10 centimeters. So this side, 10 centimeters. And the left side is also 10 centimeters. So essentially up here, we are looking at this leg being folded up so it's being moved to uh, here and this third is folded up so we want the area of this trapezoid and we want to maximize the area of the trapezoid okay so let's see what we're looking for is we need a function we need to maximize a function that has an input, the input is theta, which is the angle that the metal sheet is bent, and the output is going to be the area of that trapezoid. Okay, so what we need to do essentially is figure out what is the area of that trapezoid. So here's what our function is going to look like. It's going to look like a of theta equals blah blah blah. Right. So now let's work on trying to figure out what will our trapezoid, what's the area of a trapezoid if you have a specific theta. Okay, so I'm going to draw down here. So if I have a trapezoid Um, and I know that the base is 10 and each of the sides is 10. The first thing I can do is use, um, use geometry facts to say that since this angle is theta, right, if we look at this right triangle, this opposite angle will be theta, okay? So my picture isn't drawn very well, but over here, we've got this angle is theta, and so the opposite angle is theta. Now, just as a reminder, how do we do that? Essentially, you're having, we've got this triangle here. We know that this is theta, and so now this is a 90 degree angle, right? So suppose we call this angle alpha. The angle on the inside is alpha. Then theta plus alpha has to equal 90 degrees, right? But we've got this triangle. And the triangle has the angles 90 degrees from the right angle plus alpha plus 
whatever this angle is. And the angles in a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees, right? So that means that question mark plus alpha has to be 90 degrees, right? So if all three of the angles adds up to 180 degrees and one of the angles is a right angle, then the remaining two angles, the acute angles, have to add up to 90 degrees, okay? And that means question mark is equal to 90 degrees minus alpha, but that's precisely theta, okay? So that's kind of a quick explanation or reminder of how we get our diagram. So this is what we're working with. We're gonna have essentially two, two triangles, right? We've got two triangles, we've got this triangle here, and we've got this triangle on the right hand side and we have a rectangle in the middle. And in fact, we can take this triangle on the right and it fits right here. So the area of our trapezoid is actually gonna be the same as the area of this rectangle, okay? So the area of the trapezoid is the same as area of this new rectangle. Okay, and of course we know the area of the rectangle is gonna be uh, just length times height, right? So our length, well now we don't know what the length is. So the length is, um, Let's see here. So we've got the base of this triangle and we've got the height of this triangle, right? So the length of our rectangle is going to be 10 plus B and our height is H. So we'll have 10 plus B times H is equal to our area. Now, are we done? No, because we need a formula in terms of theta since we're trying to maximize the area of the trapezoid with respect to theta, right? It says how should theta be chosen, okay? So what this means is we need to find the relationship between B and theta and what's the relationship between H and theta? What is the relationship between B and theta. So in order to answer that, we're gonna look at our triangle a little, a little closer. We've essentially got this triangle. It's a right triangle. And we know that the hypotenuse is 10. And we've got this angle here, theta. And B is the base. So we use trigonometry to say that cosine of theta is B over 10. Right? Because cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. And in our case, adjacent, the, adjacent, the length of the adjacent side is B. The length of the hypotenuse is 10. So this means that cosine of theta equals B over 10. So B is 10 times cosine theta. So this is the relationship that we're going to use. And for our formula for area, so far what we have is in terms of <clears throat> B and H. So we had 10 plus B times H. Well now we can replace B with 10 cosine theta. So let's do that. So B is now going to be 10 cosine theta. And now let's find the relationship between H and theta. So what about H and theta? And then the answer is going to be very similar. We have again our triangle. The angle of um, the angle has a measure of theta. Our hypotenuse is 10 and H is the opposite side is the length of the opposite side of the angle. So sine of theta equals h over 10. 
which means H is 10 sine theta. So over here, let's replace H with 10 sine theta. So we now have our formula for the function where the input is theta and the output is the area of that trapezoid. The formula is 10 plus 10 cosine theta times 10 sine theta. So the function we need to maximize, we need to find the How should theta be chosen? We don't need to find the maximum of our function. We need to find where the max value of A of theta occurs. Okay. And we know A of theta is 10 plus 10 cosine theta times 10 sine theta. And actually, I can factor out a 10 and get 100 times 1 plus cosine theta times sine theta. Okay, and so this is the formula that I'm going to use for my A of theta. I'm going to change to a different color here now. So in order to find where the max value of A of theta occurs, I need to investigate the derivative of A. So let's look at a prime of theta. We're going to look, see what critical points A has, and then determine which critical point corresponds to a, an absolute max. And that will tell us the theta that we need to use to get the maximum um, area. Okay, so what is A of the derivative of A? We know that A of theta, we said, is equal to 100 times 1 plus cosine theta times sine theta. So for a prime, we're going to use the product rule. So the 100 is a constant, so it comes out in front. And we need 1 plus cosine theta, the derivative of that times sine theta, plus 1 plus cosine theta times the derivative of sine theta. Okay, so let's write this out. So we'll have 100 times, well, I guess I don't need the zoom bar. Okay, what is the derivative of 1 plus cosine theta? It'll be negative sine theta. Got negative sine theta times sine theta plus, now what is the derivative of sine theta? Cosine theta. Okay, so all of this, putting it together, we'll have 100 uh, cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus sine squared theta. Now since I'm looking for critical points, I now need to solve when is, uh, solve the following question, when is a prime of theta equal to zero? All right, so that's my new question. And the answer is, well we need zero equal to 100 times cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus sine squared theta. Okay, we can cancel out the 100, it doesn't matter, right? Divide both sides by 100, we we'll still get the same thing. Zero equals cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus sine squared theta. And now it's actually gonna be kind of difficult, add a page below. It's gonna be kind of difficult to, to work with this, let me actually copy It'll be difficult to solve this in its current form, so we use the fact that there's a trig identity involving cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Okay, so this is what we're trying to solve. So we're going to rewrite, so let me put it as a side note here. So the side note is that, that was, can't even see the yellow. So the side note. 11, 15 is that cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta is equal to, I think it is one minus two cosine squared theta minus one, two 
cosine squared theta minus one. Okay, so when we're solving our equation, we'll have zero equals, instead of the cosine squared, the cosine squared minus sine squared is now gonna be replaced with two cosine squared theta minus one. Okay, so we'll have zero equals two cosine squared theta minus one, and we still have that plus cosine theta. Now, this is actually a quadratic in cosine of theta, right? So if we rewrite this, cos two cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus one, you can see it's the same thing as two, something squared plus something minus one, and this is cosine theta, cosine theta. So we're gonna do a substitution, and we're going to let u equal cosine theta. Then our equation turns into zero equals two u squared plus u minus one. Now we're gonna solve u equals, we can use the um, quadratic formula, right? Negative b, which is gonna be negative one, plus or minus square root, b squared minus four times a, which is two, and c, which is negative one, and then all of this divided by 2a, so that'll be two times two. And when we work this out, we get negative one plus or minus the square root of, that'll be one plus eight, so it'll be square root of nine over four. So that's just negative one plus or minus three over four. So we get negative one minus three over four or negative one plus three over four, right? The negative one minus three over four will be negative four over four, which is negative one. And then down here, negative one plus three over four is is two over four, which is one half. So u equals negative one or u equals one half. But remember, u is actually cosine of theta. So we have cosine theta equals negative one or cosine theta equals one half. Now, <clears throat> in order for us to kind of make sense of this, it looks like we've got two critical points. So we have two critical points. That's what we might think, right? We would think where whatever is the theta that gives cosine of theta equal to negative one, and whatever is the theta that gives cosine of theta equal to one half. But wait a minute, we actually don't have two critical points because we need to go back and look at the domain of our function, right? Because remember, in order to have a critical point, in order for a point to be a critical point of your function, that point has to be in the domain of the original function. So let's look here. If our input is theta, what are the values of theta that we are allowing, right? So from our picture, we are bending, right? We're bending this sheet of metal, and it really only makes sense to have theta in between zero and pi over two, right? Because if you have, so zero would mean you don't bend it at all, right? So that would be zero. And then pi over two would be if you bend it, right, if you bend it to a 90 degree angle. If you bend it more than pi over two, now you're having less area, right, because you're losing this area here, okay? So it only makes sense for our domain so let's go ahead and add our domain right next to our a of theta and say theta needs to be in between zero and pi over two, okay? So down here, when we say we have, how many critical points do we have? Well, let's look. We need to look up and think about cosine of theta. Now I'm gonna think about the unit circle. So on the unit circle, remember cosine is the cosine values occur in the x, in the first coordinate, in the x coordinate. So when is cosine of theta equal to negative one? When, for what value of theta is cosine of theta equal to negative one? Well, x needs to be negative one, which means we're talking about this point right here. 
So when theta equals pi. So this value, which would be theta equals pi, is not in our domain, right? Now what about when is cosine theta equal to 1 half? Well, we know that this is 1, right, because it's a unit circle. So 1 half is here. And it looks like we're talking about looks like we're talking about this value of theta. So this value of theta, I think the coordinates are 1 half and root 3 over 2, right? So for what value of <clears throat> what value of theta is cosine theta equal to 1 half? That's the question. And the answer, I believe, is 60 degrees, which is the same thing as pi over 3. Okay, so we have one critical point, and the critical point is theta, theta equal to pi over 3. Now, the last thing we need to check, the last thing that we need to verify, is that our function a of theta has a local max or global max at our critical point. So the last thing to check, lastly, let's verify that A of theta has a local max at theta equals pi over 3. Because essentially we are classifying the critical point. Right, so you have to, just because you find a critical point doesn't mean it's going to be your answer. You need your critical point to uh, either be the max if you're looking for a max, or be the min if you're looking for a min. Classify that critical point. And to do that, I've already kind of uh, printed this out. I went on Desmos, desmos.com. And I put in for my function y of x equals, and I put in um, a prime, which is 100 times cosine squared x plus cosine x minus sine squared x. 100 times cosine squared x plus cosine x minus sine x. Okay, and then I set my x values to be in between 0 and pi and my y values I set to be in between negative 200 and positive 200. And then I just kind of scrolled to get a pretty picture. Scrolled, uh, you know, zoomed out. So it looks like our critical point, so our critical point occurs when the derivative is equal to zero. So we're talking about this is our theta. And so notice that a prime is positive, so a prime is positive to the left of our critical point, and it is zero at the critical point, and it is negative to the right of the critical point. So I'm going to draw the function in green. Our original function has to be increasing right, has to be increasing to the left and decreasing to the right. Okay, so, and this is our a of theta. And down here we've got a prime of theta. So what this tells us, since the function is increasing to the left of theta and decreasing to the right of theta, theta is a local max of, of our not theta isn't the local max. A local max occurs at theta. Okay, so by looking at the by looking at the graph <coughs> graph of a prime of theta, we see that a has or a attains. I like that better. A attains a local max at theta. So
So that is our answer, and our theta is pi over 3. Okay, so, okay, there we go. Let's look at this second problem here, the second problem. Take a moment to read it and pause the video. Okay, so for the second problem, let's go ahead and start um, our analysis. Now we're told that we have, we're given um, overall information about how to determine the illumination of an object by a light source. But what we're asked is, where should, should an object be placed on the line between the sources so as to receive to receive the least illumination. So what we need is a function. So we need to, so our goal is to minimize illumination of our object. Illumination of our object. Okay, so we need a function where the input is going to be the location of object and the output is going to be the illumination of object at that location. Okay, so we can draw a picture of our situation here. Um, we're told that we've got two light sources. So the first one, I'm just going to draw it here, almost like a little lamp. The second one, I'm going to draw here. It also is like a little lamp, right? And these are giving these light sources are giving off light. So I've got the light showing here, it's in yellow. And we're told that the light sources are 10 feet apart. So from here to here is 10 feet. Okay, and our goal is to figure out where to place our object. We can just say, imagine our object is here, right? So maybe this is our object. And now, in order to determine the location of the object, the easiest way to, the easiest way to keep track of the location would be to say, what's the distance between the object and say this left light, right? So we're kind of giving ourselves an axis, if you will, a number line. And so for the location of the object, we're gonna let that be X, okay? And we're gonna note that zero is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to 10. So we'll say if the object is X feet away from the left light source, Right, that's how we'll tell, uh, that's how we'll communicate our answer. Now, we need to come up with a formula for the illumination of the object at location X. And here's where we go to the information that's given in the problem. So the problem says that the illumination of an object by a light source is directly proportional to the strength Right, so it's directly proportional to strength. So let me actually just go ahead and start writing this down. So overall, if let's call it illumination it's I. Slim. So if illumination, we're just calling illumination I, is directly proportional to the strength, let's call strength S. So from this first sentence, this first phrase, clause, we get I is directly proportional to the strength S. K is some positive constant. 
some positive constant. So if you have, it might have been a while since you took algebra, your intermediate algebra, so you might not remember what it means to be directly proportional. This is what it means for two variables to be directly proportional. One is a positive multiple of the other. We also have here that illumination is also, so and, which means we need to multiply, it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So let's go ahead and call the distance D. And our formula is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Because it's inversely proportional, we put that the square of the distance in the denominator. So overall, what is the illumination of an object? Right? That is, uh, it depends on the strength of the source of the light and it depends on the distance between the object and the source, okay? So here for our object X, we X is going to have illumination from two sources, right? So X is gonna have illumination from this source over here plus this source over here. So let's suppose this light source has a strength. Let's just call it S1 the strength of the left light source, and let's call S2 the strength of the right light source. Not stretch, strength. Okay, now we're given one more bit of information. The last piece of information we're given is gonna help us to, to determine what's going on with the light sources one of the light sources is three times as strong as the other. Okay, so now if one of the light sources is three times as strong as the other, let's say this one, it doesn't matter which one is gonna be the strong and which one is gonna be the weak one. Let's say, let's call this one the weak one. So the one on the right will be the weak one and the one on the left will be the strong one. Now, since one of the light sources is three times as strong as the other one, this means that S2 is actually equal to three times, S1 is equal to three times S2. Does that make sense? So this last sentence, or, or the fact that one of the light sources is three times as strong as the other, allows us to eliminate a variable. So instead of writing S1 and S2, we can just call the weak one, the strength of the weak one, S, and then the strength of the strong one is gonna be 3S, right? Because it's three times the strength of the weak one. Okay, so now we are ready to write our formula for the illumination of, the illumination of X by these two light sources. Okay. So we'll have the illumination, and this is of the object when the object is located X feet from the strong strength. So let's actually be very clear about this. So X is equal to the distance between object and strong light source. Okay, so the domain is that X needs to always be in between zero and 10. Now our illumination, which depends on the distance between the object and the strong light source, is going to equal, what's our formula? K times the strength over d squared, right? So we'll have k times the strength of the strong light source over the distance to the strong light source squared plus, because the object is also gonna have illumination from the weak light source. So we'll have k times, now what is the strength of the weak light source? Well, we said it right here, the strength of the weak light source is uh, S is going to be the strength, okay? So then we'll have K times S, and now what is the distance, okay? 
what is the distance between the object and the weak light source? It's going to be 10 minus x. Right? So if from here to here is x. So if x is, if the object is x feet away from the strong light source, it has to be 10 minus x feet away from the weak light source. So we'll have 10 minus x quantity squared. Okay? And we can simplify or, you know, uh, we can rewrite this i of x because in the numerator for both, we have k times s. And we'll have 3 over x squared plus 1 over 10 minus x quantity squared. All right. So now our goal is to figure out for what value of x does i of x attain its local min because we want the least illumination. So for what value of x does i of x attain a, actually it's an absolute, an absolute min. And we know that i of x, we said we've got our formula, is k times s times 3, and I'm going to rewrite it as 3x to the minus 2, plus 10 minus x to the minus 2, because that's going to be, that's going to make it easier to take our derivative. Because, of course, we need to find our critical points, classify the critical points, and that will tell us uh, the location of the absolute min. Okay, so our derivative, remember k is a, let me go up here, k is a positive constant. And also s is a positive constant. We don't know s, but we just know that it's the strength of the weakest light source. So it's a constant. It's not changing. <clears throat> so when we take our derivative, we'll bring the k and the s together. Bring those down. Those aren't not going to change anything. And then we'll have, uh, what is this, negative 6x to the negative 3 minus 2. 10 minus x to the negative 3 times negative 1. Okay, so we'll have k s times, because this negative, so this negative is going to cancel out this negative, right? So we'll have negative 6 x to the negative 3 plus 2 10 mm -hmm. minus x to the negative 3. We can rewrite this as k times s, and we can bring out a 2 actually, as we'll have 10 minus x to the negative 3 minus 3 x to the negative 3. Okay, that's the same thing as 2ks, 1 over 10 minus x quantity cubed minus 3 over x quantity cubed. All right, so i prime is equal to 0. exactly when two K S times one over ten minus X quantity cubed minus three over X cubed equals zero. But because K and S and two are positive constants, uh, they're not going we may as well divide both both sides of the equation by those constants, and we get it's the same thing as when 1 over 10 minus x cubed minus 3 over x cubed is equal to 0. Now to solve this, we need to find a common denominator. So we have x cubed minus 3 times 10 minus x quantity cubed divided by x cubed times 10 minus x quantity cubed equals 0. But we can actually simplify the numerator because so we'll have x cubed minus 3 times 
Okay, let me see. What is 10 minus x cubed? Okay, so let's actually do a little, let me copy, copy, and let's go over here and spend a little more time figuring out this out. Okay, so we'll have x cubed minus three times 10 minus x quantity cubed over x cubed times 10 minus x quantity cubed equals zero. So this is what we're ultimately trying to solve. I just recopied it to be neat. Now I need to figure out what is 10 minus x cubed. Okay, so I don't remember it, so I'm gonna say 10 minus x cubed is the same thing as 10 minus x squared times 10 minus x. And this will be 100 minus 20x plus x squared times 10 minus x. And now I'm just going to multiply each term. So we'll have 1,000 minus 200x plus 10x squared minus 100x plus 20x squared minus x cubed. So altogether I get 1,000 minus 300x plus 30x squared minus x cubed. So, okay, so let's see here. So we'll have, let me copy, paste. So we'll have this, which remember, so now I'm gonna erase the, the rest of this so I can have this room. So we have this times three subtracted from x cubed, right? And all of this divided by x cubed times 10 minus x quantity cubed. And all of this is equal to zero. So remember, in order for a fraction to equal, to, to equal zero, the numerator must equal zero. So we are essentially looking at setting the numerator equal to zero. So x cubed minus, and I'm gonna distribute that three. So I have 3,000 plus 900x minus 90x squared plus 3x cubed equals zero. And I now have four x cubed minus 90 x squared plus 90 plus 900 x minus 3000 equals zero. Now I'm looking at this. And let me see if I see a way to solve it. So let me actually go back and let's check that our that our formula is correct. To the square of the distance, yep, that, that's it. That's... I took my derivative correctly. So I took my derivatives correctly, okay. All right, um, It's 1145. Hmm. So let me pause and just double check what I've done.